Welcome, everybody, to Survive in Advance on the Gruley True Sports Network. I'm your co-host for Survive in Advance, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host. He is a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, played on the 1981 National Championship Indiana Hoosiers, averaged two to three minutes a game. Help me welcome to the show, Steve Risley. <laughs> I played more than two to three minutes a game. I, mean, I didn't play every game. Come well, on, I'll two tell to you three this. minutes a game, give me a break. I, I've got like ten games on VHS tape, and two to three I'm not in any game. of them. Well, sometimes you are, but the thing that gets me is when you tell me, yeah, I, I played like thirty-five minutes in that game, and I watch it, and you came in for like three minutes, scored a basket, and then night let you play the last minute when the game was a blowout. Yeah, but you know what? The three minutes I came in, Mike, were the most three, most important three minutes of the game, and that's how I have to justify everything. <laughs> it's like you know, we 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 got Risley when we need him, and when he's important, we put him in. So, all right, whatever, but, Steve. You know. um, today <laughs> we have a man that got into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, and I don't think he had to campaign for it. Um, Angelo Pizzo, screenwriter, <laughs> film producer of Hoosiers and Rudy. It's great to finally have an Indiana legend on the show. How you doing, Angelo? Oh, I'm, doing, I'm doing great, thanks. All right. Uh, let's just start off from the Mike, beginning. Mike, wait, wait. What? It's one thing you left off. There's something that Angelo and I also have in common. We're both in the Hall of Fame, and we both are Sagamores of the Wabash. They oh, let you do that I didn't too, know Steve? that you were. I know. That's a uh, shock. Well, I bet the guy that <laughs> yeah, voted for I mean, that got really drunk one night and said, hey, let's put Risley in. He'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> you don't get voted in to be a sag of the wall, guys. That's the highest civil award the governor of the state of Indiana can give him. Who was, who was yeah, the governor I got my at the time? Going. Who'd you get yours from, Angela? Well, I hate to say this, but uh, we got we've got two. Uh, one was from uh, Evan Bay. <laughs> Evan Bay. And uh, the other was William Orr. Okay. There you go. So he yep. got his from respected my, governors. All right. <laughs> I got Mike Motus Bowen in 81 when we won the championship. He named all the members of the 81 team as Sagamore. And, and you know what? Oh, okay. Of all this, the, the mementos I have, because I worked for Dan Quayle for four years when he was senator in yeah. Indiana. And everybody, I, you know, Mitch Daniels was the state director for Luger and everything, and, and they all had their Sagamores of the Wabash. I'm like, damn, I've got one of those somewhere. I mean, I put it, folded it up and put it away, thinking, <laughs> okay, it's another piece of paper you get when you win, you know, a championship. And I'm a uh, bell, the ca- captain of the Bell of Louisville, a Kentucky colonel and all that stuff. And I pull it out and I fringed my Sagamore of the Wabash and hung it in my office from when I worked for Quail. And everybody went nuts. Like, you're a Sagamore of the Wabash? And I'm like, yeah, what is this? I didn't even know what it was. And then, you know, they just yeah. hand you a piece of paper. That's an interesting. So that's another award. That. So we're both... It's another award Isaiah Thomas earned you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Be Isaiah, 26 points in the championship game, baby. You know, that's the way it goes. All right, Angelo, let's go but ahead. This show is not about me. It's about I, I know, but you keep making it that. Seconds. So I'm trying to stop you, but it's not working. All right, <laughs> Angelo, you, you grew up in yeah. Bloomington, Indiana. When did you become right. an Indiana University fan? Well, our first house, when my parents, my dad got a job at the hospital, uh, you know, setting up the laboratory, he's a pathologist. He was actually the first pathologist in uh, Monroe County. And uh, our house was on 7th and Jordan, and it's actually part of the university now. And uh, it was literally a two-block walk to the old field house. And I would go over there when I was six or seven years old. And those are the days where if you disappear from your house at six or seven, they, you didn't call the police. Um, and uh, I used to watch practice. And it was uh, the, uh, especially late 50s was the, the time that I was uh, most avid and, and most involved. And that was, uh, you know, Gary Long and Walt Bellamy, Herbie Lee, Peter Bremsky. Uh, and uh, I became uh, uh, a, a tried and true and devoted uh, Indiana basketball fanatic. And at that point, it's never let up. So does that mean the genesis, I guess, of the movie Hoosiers came more not from Indiana high school basketball, but more of your love for Indiana University? Yes, it did. In fact, um, I, I would call myself extremely uh, knowledgeable and as I said, 
passionate in my following of Indiana University basketball. I didn't really, I mean, being a sports fan, I would watch the tournament when it was televised. And, uh, but I was an aficionado of high school basketball. And of course, the Milan story was just something they would pull out. And Steve will tell you this. They, they would pull this out every tournament season, I think, to inspire, you know, the smaller schools. This is before class basketball, you know, to give them a sense that they had a chance to. So it, was, it became kind of the classic folk tale or folk myth. All right, Steve. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I, you know, I grew up like, like you. I grew up in high school basketball, so like, and I'm one of the fortunate ones. And we got to play. Uh, we won two sectionals in Hinkle, and they, you know, they took Hinkle out of the mix, which was very sad for high school basketball. Yeah, uh, we won regionals there, and I've gotten to meet Bobby Plump several times, and mm-hmm. it's just a, a, it's hilarious how it's kind of like that fish story where you know you caught the the, the, the foot long bass, and all of a sudden now it's eight foot long shark. And the story about the legend of Bobby Plump has grown so much, and the story of Milan mm-hmm. has grown so much. You know, Mike lives down in that area, and um, it, that, it, it's so fun to hear the different tales. And, and to listen to Bobby Plump talk is a treat. I mean, it, it, it's a two-hour he, movie all in some cell. He's he's one of the great yarn spinners, great storytellers of all time. Yeah, he can spin yeah. it. Yeah, yeah he's, he's the thing a great is, guy. To that day, when you go to Milan. Everything still has 1954 plastered all over it. Well, they have a really uh, a, a terrific museum there that's yeah. worth visiting. Mm-hmm. The and, 54 uh, Museum? Yeah, great job. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they repainted the water tower, too. Yeah. That water tower said yeah. 1954. The, 1954 right, state champs. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's the great thing about Indiana high school basketball, though. And I think that is something that when you wrote the movie Hoosiers. The thing about it is everybody in every state kind of understood it because there's so much class basketball. Everybody always wants David to beat Goliath. And this was one of the few cha- few times where it happened. Now, another time it happened, I don't know if you remember this, Angelo, or not, but in 1977, you know, Aurora High School, a small school, beat Lawrence Central, who had this big goofy kid who was like six foot eight who went on to play for Indiana. So that's why a lot of times, you know, Steve gets a little upset when you start talking about that. <laughs> no, I, it was, I mean, that, that's, that was what was great about high school basketball was that, that day it happened. And, and it, it, that's what made Indiana high. So that's what made Hoosiers. And that, that was what it was all about was a small school like Aurora comes in and we were the power. We were supposed to go to the state championships that year. Carmel ended up winning. And uh, with Herman and, and Burrell and those guys, and, and you know that's what it was all about. And I don't ever regret being a part of that game. I mean, I hated losing it, but I, it was to be part of that in that Saturday. And I remember us going there and thinking we're going to play Richmond that night with Robbie Willis, and 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 then they got upset too. And and Aurora comes in and, and spanks us, and that's what the lower the love is all about. And I think one of the things that, that perpetuated the love of the movie Hoosiers, making it one of the greatest sports movies of all time. I have no regrets. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any regrets about losing. I mean, playing in that game, I hate losing it, but it, it is what it is. All right. So Angelo, when did you first realize that you wanted to be a screenwriter and what was that process for you to get to that point? Well, it's actually a, a long story uh, that I can really uh, tell you in the simplest ways that I never really thought about, recognized, or embraced the idea that I was going to be a screenwriter until I finally did it. I worked, I went to University of Southern California in grad school, and um, I was getting, I got a master's of work in my doctorate. I was going to teach in a film studies program somewhere. I was not anxious to be involved in the film business per se, per se because I heard so many <clears throat> terrible things about how you had to be a shark, you had to be venal, you had to be cutthroat, and I didn't think I had any of those qualities. But fortunately, um, I, I one of the classes that um, was an internship that uh, 
in my last year, and it was for the last season of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And I got to know the president of the company who was married to Mary, Grant Tinker, and he Tinker. he suggested to turn me on to a guy who was producing a television series on the same lot. And this guy asked me to do some research for his show, and we became buddies, and uh, he eventually hired me to be his assistant. So I learned how to make movies. I learned how to, you know, I learned the whole process. And it took me about six years. And I, I had various jobs in, in, in development, what they call our executive positions. I worked for Warner Brothers, uh, Fox, 20, uh, Time Life Films. And in my one of my last jobs, I was vice president of production, you know, supervised production of a number of different movies over the years. But uh, it was I, I went to the president of the company. I said I wanted to develop a pro uh, a movie about high school basketball in Indiana, and he said go for it. And that's when I went. And I started. I, I called them, you know, the agents that I knew, and asked. I wanted to. I wanted somebody from Indiana to write it. I didn't want somebody to come in and do research. I wanted somebody who knew it in their bones. And ultimately, the the company, the Time Time Inc. that I was working for, shifted their assets to HBO and TriStar. And they offered me a job in, at HBO. TriStar was, wasn't going to happen for another six months. Or they offered me to pay out my contract, which was an annual contract. That was nine months of salary. And it was at that time that I I put it together to uh, try my hand at writing my own screenplay. So that's how it started. It wasn't any grand plan. But I will say parenthetically about the timing, and that's this. I uh, was in New York at the timing building when... Indiana, this is 1981, when Indiana won that regional uh, to sending them to the Final Four in Philadelphia. And I stayed an extra week so I could watch the game. And I went down with a friend, and we were there. And uh, I decided to go with the team back to uh, back to uh, Bloomington. Uh, Steve doesn't know it. I was in the plane. Dr. Bamba is a close friend of my dad's. And uh, I got a hitched ride, and... Uh, uh, we had quite a party when we got back. It was about a week long party, but it was at that point. You were on, you were on our plane. Um, yeah, you were on our plane. You don't remember me? Yeah. Just the groom was too hungover. The groom is the one we flew back. <laughs> we flew in Indianapolis and took the bus ride. Were you on the bus with us? No, I got another ride from the airport. Because we landed in Indianapolis. I know you did. I was there. Yeah, and we, we, we took the ride down 37. Oh, my God, I did not know you were on that plane. Unbelievable. Yes. Uh, you know what? Well, well, here's yeah. what we did. I went out with Whitman and Kitchell, and, and we, yeah. <laughs> we, Knight just said, we, we won the game, and he said, Knight said to us, he said, okay, the plane leaves at 6 in the morning or something like that. Be respectful, know who you are, and represent Indiana like you expect to represent Indiana. So I don't think we ever got back to the hotel. I think we called the managers and said, pack our bags up. We're not, we stayed in Cherry Hills, New Jersey, because Knight kept us out yep. of the, the line by being in Philadelphia. And yep. he, we just said, pack our bags, throw all our crap out of the hotel room in our bags, and meet us at the airport. And so our, we just showed up. And I think we drove right to the damn airport. We were a little inebriated. And <laughs> I, I don't remember you being on that flight. And everybody, well, that's why. I, I, there were a lot of people that were in the I don't remember anything about that flight home, basically. <laughs> So how? Why would you remember me on it? <laughs> I, you I know, I, I, a well, student manager that you didn't recognize. <laughs> well, you have to realize at that time, Angel, we stayed as far away from night as we could. And one of my greatest all-time stories ever it happened on the on that G one on that grooming uh, with Bob yeah. Knight. And we don't have time to talk about it. we've talked about it before. But uh, that, one of my famous, most famous meetings. It was actually in the season on the brink. It was a story told on in that, on, on that book. By Feinstein, happened on that yeah. plane, and you know, it, but that I did not know you were on that plane. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, I will also, yeah. I'll also tell. I I have a few nice stories of my own. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, well, Who we'll share it off the air, and it has to do with yeah. that plane because Coach Knight invited me to go with the team on uh, one road trip uh, a year, 
and I took him up on it. One of the road trips, it was talk about terrible timing, was uh, I can't remember exactly the year, um, but it was up to Minnesota when they lost by the biggest number of uh, in history of Indiana basketball. They got beat like 102 to 56, and he basically tanked yeah. the game, and he threw in his bench. And Pat Knight, I think, was the leading scorer, and Richard Mandeville was second. That's uh, and you talk about a plane ride back home. All right, let's move uh, on. That plane, uh, <laughs> how that plane is, everyone was still in one piece because Knight, because he used to sit right behind the cockpit, you know, up there in the. Front. I know where he sat. He, he, I know. Yeah, I sat in the tail. I was the very right. I, I sat in the very tail. I just had that single seat back there, and I just stared at him the whole time, see what the hell crap was going to happen. I mean, we had food thrown off the plane onto the runway. How many times? I don't know. But that plane, you yeah, can do you a know, movie and, on that and, plane. And the pilot had to be constantly oh, the pilot, adjusting yeah. because you didn't know when he was going to go off. And sometimes, oh. and in our case, it was when we were taxiing out to take off, and he uh-huh. had to oh. pull off to the side. You've been there, yeah. right? No. <laughs> Mike, have I told the story before? I've told you the story about Well, it's like we, we went to Michigan, we got beat, and we were trying to win the Big Ten Championship, we got beat. He ripped the urinal off the wall in, in the locker room. He, we get on the plane. There's $300 worth of McDonald's on the plane. We're all hungry. It's, it's 2 o'clock in the morning in Ann Arbor. You know, we're cold. It's like zero, negative 12. He takes the food, throws it off. We don't get 10 feet off the ground. He starts beating on the side of the plane. And the pilots come back. And I'm like, God, don't, don't piss him off anymore. Don't do that. Well, night, I'm sitting all the way back. And night literally rips the tie off his neck. <laughs> <laughs> and he makes a beeline for me. For the next hour and a half, I, mean, I didn't play in the game. Like I was in a doghouse, and he yelled at me the whole way back. And it, it's a long story. It's in a season on the brink. I know we don't have a lot of time with you, but yeah. there, there are so many stories you can tell about that airplane. I don't think they yes. have that plane anymore, do they? No, they don't. Definitely not. You know, yeah, you one of the things gone. that I'll never forget was everybody scrambling to get a seat as far away from him as yeah. possible. Do you- <laughs> well, we, you know, being a senior, you, you, you got your seat selected based on seniority. So all the young kids yeah. had to sit up front with him. And the older yes. guys, there was a card table on the other side. And, and Tommy Baker and those guys would all go over there. Tolbert, those guys would go play cards. Yeah. Woodson. Yeah. And I'm like, I just want to go back to the back. Where, and I, that's where, that, and get yeah. Far away that's from me I like could possibly the... get. That's yeah. hilarious. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so – Go Let's ahead. move on. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. How long was the process to write the movie? You know what I mean? I mean, what was the process yeah. to get to making yeah, the movie? Yeah. I mean, I struggled uh, because I'd never written one, even though I'd written, I read probably a thousand screenplays and worked with writers. That was my job. So, you know, it's a lot different being an editor and, you know, looking at a blank piece of paper and creating magic. And I just, I struggled and I was my own worst critic. So it took me about a year and I went back to work doing development work at the time. And then, um, that's when I finally sent it to David and he said, let's do this as a team. And, uh, that's what started a three year process of submitting it to people. And we're talking about everybody because of, of our, experience in the business and the people we knew we had no problem getting it to anybody we wanted to including actors and the fortunate thing for us was that people the actors really responded to the script and luckily gene hackman um was one of the early people who signed on but even with gene we couldn't get it financed so it took about i mean he signed on two years before we finally got it financed so it was three years of no's until finally there was a guy who was the least, least likely person imaginable to write a check to make it happen. We always thought it would be somebody from the Midwest or Indiana who loved basketball. And all those people you know, said, yeah, well, it's too regional, too specific. And it doesn't, there's no log line. There's no poster. We can't sell this. And, and uh, but there was a guy who would, who wrote the check, had never seen a basketball game, had never heard of the state of Indiana. He was a fairly uneducated Brit 
who um, was a boxer, who's a pretty good athlete, a boxer and a, and a soccer player. And he happened to have a trove of laundered mafia money that he was making movies with at the time. And he read the script and he cried throughout the script. The reason he cried had nothing to do with basketball or the coach or anything like that. His father was an alcoholic who drove a taxi and he would show up to his uh, soccer matches and embarrass him. He'd walk on the field and start yelling at refs. And uh, that he connected so deeply and emotionally with that relationship that Dennis Hopper character, Shooter, and his son, that he's, and he had a rule. If he ever cries reading the script, he's going to get it made. So that's how Hoosiers got made, just random. All that's right, sort so of the story of the film business. <laughs> All right, let me let me ask you this. Um, sports yeah. movies, the thing that makes the ones fail fail are lack of authenticity. So when you are yeah. casting the basketball players, are you casting guys that can play basketball first, or are you looking for actors that you can make a basketball player? Because these look like, especially the Jimmy Chitwood character, this he looked like a basketball player first. Well, here's here it started off before in the way uh, it was in the pre-planning writing stages. I knew in order to make this real, authentic, because I can't tell you how many sports movies that I had seen that I was totally thrown out of the movie because yeah. players can't play. You know, Robert De Niro and Bang the Drum Soli couldn't even throw a ball. Jimmy Pearsall, you know, the same way. William I mean, it goes on and on. playing Babe Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could go back. And uh, the uh, so what I did was I made sure that no character had more than four lines. So there was no heavy lifting when it came to acting. And, uh, and, and, and of course, with Jimmy Chitwood, I think he only had two lines. So he's, the, you know, the, the mystery. And uh, it was all about getting the best players we could with the right looks. So, yeah, we, um, we actually had an open tryout in, uh, at, at IUPUI Gym, and uh, Tom Abernathy was one of our, our consultants and helped us. Out of, there was well over 1,000 kids showed up, and then, you know, we, we picked a, a final group of uh, around 70 kids who we knew who found out we could, who could really play, uh, including Ollie, who was a really good player, played for L&M. But uh, and then we kind of narrowed them down just by getting them in, and started to have them talk and and do little scenes where we got a sense of their accents and uh, their their ability to relax under pressure. So uh, that's how we ended up with the final group. So Ollie play did it, Ollie it, play it, for the L and M team that had the Elephant Brothers that was on Sports or yes. in Sports Illustrated. Yep. Okay. I yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, and his sister was uh, you know the cheerleader, and she was a cheerleader for uh, the who's the Hickory team as well. Yeah, and you talked about yeah, you, you know, go ahead. The thing was, I, I used to you know, I, at that time in '86, I was working for Pfizer. I started my career with Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, where I spent 25 years working for it. I went to Knightstown every day. I, I, yeah. I had doctors in Knightstown, and I made sure I was at that gym driving around trying to sneak a peek, trying to get close and thinking, they're going to discover me. They're, they're, they're going to find me. I'm 6'8". <laughs> I was good looking back then, but then... No, you, you know, weren't. I'm thinking, I'm you were just, not good looking that, yeah. back then. You're just you, a lot you, better you know looking you, than you are now. <laughs> Steve, you wouldn't have fit in the movie, because I don't think there was anybody I know, in the movie no, over 6'4". Yeah. Yeah, I've played in that gym, and my son's played in that gym several times, but I remember 86 is going to Knightstown. I said, I'm, where are you going? I, I'm going out of I-70. I'm going to stop in Rushville. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Knightstown. You go to Knightstown again? How many doctors you got in Knightstown to? What are you going back to Knightstown for? They're filming Hoosiers there. I want to be watching. I'm going to be a part of it. You know, so it, that, I remember that time so vividly when all those trucks and crews were now out here, like in California. Now you see these, these, these trucks and you see these production crews. They, they take up blocks of, of your neighborhood. They film wherever they want to film, and they use the valley a lot to film, as you know. Um, and, yeah. and it's like, but back then, was, I remember driving to Nice Town virtually every week, going out there as you were filming. All right, now so. you also brought up Gary Long earlier. Wasn't his son Buddy in yeah. the movie? Yes, Brad. Uh huh. 
And then and also, I know you had another Indian. Yeah, you had Jimmy Rail's son, also, wasn't it? Yeah, we and it was it was uh, he was one of my heroes. Uh, you can imagine what uh, for a you know eight to ten year old kid. I think he was a, yeah, I was about ten when he was uh, hitting his sixty one points, two sixty one point games. That was before the three point line, and uh, you know, skinny little guy. I mean, he was my hero. So it was a lot of fun that we were between takes when Jim Sr. would show up that we would have shooting contests. And, of course, he could still stroke it, and he, nobody could touch him. He was, he was a, he's a special guy. Love that guy. Yeah. One of the greatest shooters in Indiana history, and a lot of people don't remember him, but Jimmy Rail, Rick Mount, all those guys could really shoot the ball. And when you look at the movie – I think you talked about, you know, the Dennis Hopper character with his son. The other thing that I think, and I always wondered this, and it's not to take a shot at the movie because I know a movie can only be so long, but I thought the Gene Hackman character with, you know, Jimmy's sister, whatever it was, I think that it kind of struck me how that relationship wasn't really developed during the movie that much. Well, actually, the the thing about um, what we, you know, what we learned along the way was that, uh, you know, this is our first movie, you know, myself and David, and uh, in terms of actually making it ourselves, our first cut was three and a half hours long, and we it ended up to be an hour and fifty six, and uh, we actually had a two hour and twenty five minute cut that we thought was perfect. In that two-hour and 25-minute cut was three more scenes between Barbara and Gene and that, were, that did develop that, that relationship. And the evolution, how it evolved between the time, I can't remember what the scene was, but when he kisses her in that you know, open field, it yeah. seems abrupt because there, there were two scenes in between that were, had to be cut out. And it killed us. And by the way, um, in the 20th anniversary of the DVD release, there is on the second DVD the last 30 minutes of those scenes in there. So we couldn't do a director's cut because they had lost the negative. And uh, we couldn't actually put it together to make it look seamless. And so if you're curious about what that relationship could have been, Take a look at those deleted scenes. Yeah, I will. I will definitely do that. And the the other question I had here was, it's kind of loosely based on 1954 Mile, and the only thing that really was, I think, was the championship game. Um, did you go to Milan? Talk to people there? Anything like that before you shot the movie? Yeah, I did. In fact, that was my original intention was to to do the Milan story, but you know. Screenwriting 101 or Dramatic Writing 101, the, the basic precept behind drama is, uh, this is a sentence I'll never forget, it was written on a blackboard, and they had blackboards, uh, in my screenwriting class at USC. The essence of all drama is conflict, internal or external. And the first person that I talked to was Gene White. Okay. And he had a store in Milan called the White Speed and Chick Store. And I had a conversation with him uh, looking for what could be conflict. I said, so how did you guys get along with each other? Oh, we all loved each other. What about the coach? Oh, we loved him and he loved us. It was all the best. Nobody, everybody got along perfectly. Oh, yeah. What about the townspeople? Oh, yeah. They all loved us, and we all loved them. And I'm thinking, that could be the most boring movie of all time. <laughs> so I had to throw out doing the actual story. That would be left for a documentarian and uh, create a drama with uh, wholesale new characters. You know, I tried the, to capture the, first the time, time saw... and the place. It wasn't so much the story. It was the time and the place I yeah. wanted to capture. The the first time I saw the movie in the theaters and and I, you know, I 
and I, because it is basically it's basically a fictitious story, uh, loosely based on the Milan. Yeah, program. it doesn't say that. anywhere. It it doesn't say anywhere. No, in the you know, movie but everybody assumes that anybody in Indiana knows yeah. what the the premise of it is. And that's, because if you don't know how Indiana high school basketball, you don't get it. it, it and, and but on the very last scene of the movie, what's your very last scene of the movie? You're asking me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What the last Gene Hackman the walks back into the gym, and there's a little oh, kid oh, I see what you're saying. shooting yeah. baskets. And you, all you just say is Hackman to go, hey, son, great jump shot. What's your name? And all I had to say was yeah. Larry. <laughs> Funny. And I thought, if you want to say Larry Bird, because it's timing's off time-wise, but if you just – the legend of Indiana and French Lick and Larry Bird, I thought, oh, oh you blew it. You needed to say – have Hackman say <laughs> – I said the very yeah. first time I saw him in the theater, I said, just say, hey, kid, what's your name? Larry. That's all he had to say. It, it would have melted everybody. That would have been funny. But then it would be <laughs> yeah. Then it would be player specific, and we didn't want to do that. You know? Yeah, then you'd yeah. have people yeah, like me saying that's movie, about 10 I'm not years too person, soon. So. So. Um, yeah, all right. I, I know. It's just a fictitious movie. I mean, there's, there's all things. So I'm just saying, if you just would have said, you don't have to say Larry Bird. You say, what's your kid? What's your son, what's your name? You're a good jump shooter. What's your name? Larry. And it just would have, everybody would have laughed their asses off. Like well, Angelo, it just, then it would have tied as, it as you're finding out today, which I've known for the last six months of doing this show, is Steve has way too much time on his hands. <laughs> no, no, here's the funny thing. My, son, my son's in the industry. My, and, and my son's in the industry, and he, he works on projects. And every night he comes home, before he talks to us at dinner, we have to sign non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, funny. he's been doing that with his son and his wife since he was six. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> that, uh, let's talk about the Oscars. I, I, I love this story. Beat an Indiana fan. I remember the night IU won it all in 1987 so well. And yeah. you guys had the opportunity. You were, The Hoosiers was up for the Oscar, a few Oscars. And you had a choice to make between – watching the Hoosiers play in a national championship game and being at the Oscars. What was your decision and why? Well, what happened was uh, it was that uh, it, unfortunate uh, two major things in my life were happening at the same time. Indiana playing Syracuse in the finals and the Academy Awards. But I never thought it was going to be an issue because Indiana played UNLV in the afternoon game. UNLV was number one team in the country, and they were favorites. And I thought there was no chance they could beat that. That was a team full of NBA players, and yeah. you remember that team well, I'm sure. Yeah, Armand Gillian. And when they Freddie pulled Banks. the upset, yeah. And they just, yeah, they destroyed that team. It was like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Because we had tickets. We had our tuxes rented. We, we had the limo rented, and we had it all. And uh, I, uh, I had Dennis Hopper go in for rehearsal. He was an, he was nominated for best supporting actor. And you remember those Sony Watchmen? Yeah. I was I was going to try to watch it while we were there, but he said he tried it. He said the, too much electronics. It couldn't get any reception. So on Monday morning, we uh, we. I got up and I, I, I realized I knew what I had to do. I called Dave and I said, I can't go. I have to watch this game on television. I said, I'll be back to the Academy Awards. But when Indiana's playing for a national championship game, that takes priority over everything. And uh, he agreed. So we set up two televisions, advised people over. One TV had the Academy Awards and the other had the Oscars. Now, the interesting thing about how what happened with that is – the, um, a reporter from the Bloomington paper called me and asked me that morning or that afternoon what, what we were going to do. And I told him we weren't going to the Academy Awards, saying and watching the movie, I mean, watching the, the championship game. And the next day, and I have this particular front page framed, it, is, uh, it says Indiana wins national championship. And down to the left, and a big article with a big, big headline: Hoosiers creators watch game, not don't go to the Academy Awards or something like that. Anyway, 
it turns out that Joby Wright, who's a friend of mine, told me that when he he was reading that front page of the paper in an office and called Joby in and said, do you know these guys who watch the game instead of the uh, – the, the, I mean, he watched the, the game instead of going to the Oscars, he, and we knew Joby from college. He said, yeah. He said, those are true Indiana fans. Tell them they got to come by. I want to meet them. And that was the beginning of how I first met Knight and, and uh, our long history after that. So that's yeah, that story. See, people, don't re- I, I will, I, I, people don't realize that. I can tell that, you the story until... the first time I met Knight. But that's another one. Good, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I want to hear your first story because, yeah. Well, he, uh, I never, we were really busy. I mean, that was, that was obviously in March. And I didn't get back to Bloomington until October. And uh, he, I, I called up the athletic department and said I was invited to come to practice. No, I called up Joby. That's what it was. And uh, Joby said, just come on by. Of course, you know how it is. IU practice. It's like a lockdown state. So, you know, trying to get out of yeah. prison, get into prison. And, uh, you know, like three guys came up with checking my ID and my writing. My, had my, my name down. And all during the practice, Coach Knight kept on staring up at me and giving me the darkest, angriest looks imaginable. And I was like, I don't think he knows who I am. He invited me. Why is he giving me those that evil eye? Well, it got so bad that at the end of the practice, I just waved at Joby, and I just I didn't I, I just didn't feel the right the vibe was there for whatever reason. And he had he had a reason to be mad at me for something I didn't know why. And so as I was just as I was ready to to leave the building. One of the managers grabbed me and said, Coach Knight wants to see you. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? Anyway, I walk up, and he's talking to another guy, and I'm just standing there like an idiot. And uh, he glances over at me and gives me a really hard stare again, and I'm just bracing myself. He finally ends his conversation with his guy. He walks over to me, and he has his hand out. And... Uh, he said, you owe me money. I said, what are you talking about? He said, all the dialogue you stole from me from this movie. And I, <laughs> then he started laughing. He put his arm around my shoulder and said, I loved it. Great movie. You really got it. <laughs> and he said, what are you guys, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm go have dinner with uh, my, my parents. He said, no, you're not. You and I, we're going to Chicago. I got to see a recruit. You're coming with me. So I spent the next 10 hours with Coach Knight. That was, that was a conversation I would like to – I wish I had to record it for that one. Yeah, okay, so let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question because, I mean, I've, I've known Bob Knight for 45 years. I mean, he started recruiting me yeah, sure. in 1975, and I've known yeah. the man. Is, is he misunderstood? And, and from a person I'm, – I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a biased person. And yeah. In your eyes – is he misunderstood or do people understand him? Well, I, I think there's not an easy answer to that. <clears throat> I yeah, think there's that not. the general, the general, the general, the easiest answer is to say, yes, he is misunderstood. And I'll tell you why, because <clears throat> people's perception of him is only through a very, very narrow prism. Right. And that prism is watching him, on the sidelines of a, a basketball court or in a press conference right. with cameras in front of him and people asking him questions. Well, that's only maybe three or 4% of his life. The rest of his life, yeah. he's, he's just a guy. He's a normal person going about, you know, he doesn't yell at waitresses, yeah. and, you know, hurry things up. In my conversation with him that lasted 10 hours, we never talked basketball. He hates talking. He was, he always hated talking basketball with me, but people, what people don't know about him is uh, the people know he's smart. They know he's extremely intelligent and they, they read that he's we're very well read and he's a history buff. I'm a history buff. We talk history mm-hmm. all the time, but beyond that, he's a very curious guy. 
so he must have asked me hundreds of questions about how we went about making the movie and what how I went about writing it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just think of him as just a big blowhard pontificator, that he has all the answers and no one else has anything else interesting to say. But he's a great conversationalist, and uh, he's a thoughtful person. And, yes, I've seen him be really kind to people. I've seen him be horrible to people, too. But, uh, you know, he has – he's a complicated person who has – I've always tried to describe him as someone who's, whose strengths are huge and his flaws are huge, too. I mean, he just – he's larger than life in every way possible. Um, and uh, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy. I will also say that um, – uh, well, I was shooting a movie in Texas two years ago called My All American, and I got to know Rick Barnes really well. And this is something that I found interesting. He said to me when we were – Rick and I were having lunch, he said – I don't know if you what you think about Coach Knight as a coach in context with the greatest. I'm going to give you my opinion. I think he's the greatest basketball coach to ever live, college or pro. That includes Wooden and Red Auerbach. He said, I would not want to go up against him with similar players. I could, I didn't, wouldn't. He's the only coach I would uh, coach against I wouldn't have confidence I could be. Oh, so that meant a lot so to me because uh, yeah. I've always thought that he was beyond brilliant, but I, but I knew I was biased. So to hear that from Rick, that meant a lot. Yeah. Well, and Rick's doing say, a great a job player this year, isn't for him, Yeah. As a player, the play, he's not the greatest basketball coach. He is. But more importantly, he was the greatest teacher I ever had. Yes, I mean, absolutely. It, it, he was a better yeah. teacher than he was a basketball coach, and that's what. Well, just, I, I just goes assume in line that it happened both. Saying. Yeah, he was a better teacher. He taught us. He didn't discipline us, and people think he was a disciplinarian. He didn't discipline us. He taught us how to discipline ourselves, and that's what you know. Give a kid a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a kid to fish, you're feeding for a lifetime. <clears throat> and you look at average. You talk about Tom Abernathy. Tom Abernathy is one of the greatest people ever to come out of Indiana University. Yeah. He's one of my idols. And yeah. but Tom is a guy everybody that played for him, Scotty and Kent and Alford and me and Jimmy Thomas and Isaiah even Isaiah went back and got his degree after leaving and being a multimillionaire, went back to IU and got his degree because he cut a deal with his mom, Knight did that made Isaiah say, You're gonna get your degree from Indiana and he went back and got his degree. You know that. But he was a great teacher. And yeah. it, it, that's what people don't understand about him. And it was, it is so funny to hear somebody else's opinion because we get lambasted as players when we start to defend Bob Knight, because you're so right. People see three, three, three percent of Bob Knight. And it's what the media wants to create. And, and tell you the greatest thing I ever got out of Bob Knight, you know, 60 minutes did the piece on him. I think it was maybe he's 80, 79 or 80. Dan Rather came yeah. in. Yeah, I can't remember the exact year it was, but they, you know, in 60 minutes when they do something, uh, as you know, because you're a producer, I mean, they followed us for two weeks. I mean, they, we, had, we had a film crew follow me for an entire day. I mean, they filmed everything I did an entire day. So they had enough film after, you know, to edit it however they wanted to edit it to make Bob Knight be an angel, a god, a demigod, a saint, or Satan. You know, they, they could right. do whatever they wanted to. They had so much film. They were in practice every day. He gave them full access. And, of course, you know, 60 minutes, it's a 14-minute segment, you know, with commercials. But they do. And, and But the, the whole deal was with Knight, and you talk about the fact that he's a historian, because he used to get on the plane and give us all, we get on the bus, and he has a book, and said, really, I want you to read this book on World War II. And World War II was yep. a big thing. I mean, he loved McGarvey. Oh, I know. He loved Patton. He yeah. loved those generals. And he, gave, he had me a book, and said, really, read this book, and I'm going to call you out of practice. I'm going to have you tell me something about this book. And people don't know that about him, that he would do that. Yeah. And it would be not basketball related. But so yeah, the, the no, deal he, was with, with yeah. 60 minutes was that he said, I'll do this piece under one condition. That's that Dan rather comes in and sits down with my team for a three hour session and lets my team ask them any question they want to. And I'll tell you what, I, what I learned that night, that day, there's no more intelligent man in the world at that point in time that I knew than Dan Rather. 
because yeah. you didn't understand and the opportunity to sit there and and to talk to Dan Rather about world history, world politics, and you know he he challenged us all to come up with great questions, and every player had to come with a list of questions to ask Dan Rather. And it wasn't, we sat there for, instead of practicing that day, we sat and talked to Dan Rather in our locker room for three hours. Yeah. And then he had one of the hostages from 1980, Tom Scherer or Dave Scherer, I can't remember the exact name, but he was one of the hostages. He came to IU and he spent time and came in the locker room and told us about, and told us the history of how the whole event of, of the, the Iran hostages happened. But see, that's the things that people don't understand about Bob Knight that he did. He was a much better teacher than he ever was a basketball coach, and he was a great basketball coach. Well, I think they go hand in hand, myself. But yeah, uh, they do. Well, yeah, and I've always said basketball was his tool to teach. I mean, some people yeah. have textbooks, some people have, you know, um, uh, flip charts. His was basketball. That's how he taught. Yeah, he was. Uh... He knows how to press buttons, both negatively and positively. Yeah. And the other thing that people think about, and I, I've, I've went to enough practices uh, with him, that um, people just have a vision that he's screaming, you know, for two straight hours. When, in fact, I, in a couple of practices, he hardly That's raised true. his voice. You know, it just depend on his mood or his feeling about the team. Or sometimes it's just, you know how it is, just a player. He'd just ride a player. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it was. Very, yeah, well, it was never consistent. You never knew when it was going to happen, though. Everybody played like it could happen at any time. Trust me, I got kicked out of more practice than you attended. So, <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Uh, yeah. All right. I know we're coming close to the okay, hour. So we promised we'd keep can, it too because Steve did, can't be Angel, quiet. Go ahead, it, Steve. <laughs> wait, uh, one more question. Uh, I, I know, I know. I, I'm, I'm like in heaven now, Angelo. Can you do a movie about night? Can you make one? No. Um, you know, I think that every attempt to try to capture him would be uh, – would leave, would leave people wanting. I, I think that uh, uh, Brian Dennehy is a great actor, and he tried to mm-hmm. capture night and – the adaptation to, of Feinstein's book, and it just didn't work. I mean, I, I just can't, I can't see it. I, I don't know. Here's the other thing I'll say about Knight, Coach Knight, that was special about him, and that's something that you can't really know unless you're specifically around him, and it's the effect he has on other people. He has as much charisma of any actor or politician that I've ever been around. Mm-hmm. I, you know, to me, the top three in terms of effect on a room were, uh, and I've worked with Mel Gibson and Tom Cruise on films and I would, and, and I would walk into restaurants with them. And sometimes people didn't even notice when Bob Knight walks into a room, people know it's almost like, you know, that EF yeah. button, everybody stops, uh, yeah. And the other two were Bill Clinton and uh, and uh, Bobby Kennedy. They had a, just an amazing effect uh, on a room. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he had a he had a power that um, he used positively and negatively. But I think it's really would really be hot, hard to capture. Um, you know, trying to to get that on film. You know what I would compare that to? Yeah. I, I would compare that to the attempt to make a movie about Muhammad Ali because the character exactly. is so large exactly. that it's almost yeah. impossible yeah. for exactly. anybody to pull that off. Well, and yeah, Will you're Smith, never going to come. Yeah, Will that. Smith did a good yeah. job, and I still thought the movie yeah. stunk just because it's Ali. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. everybody well, who's tried to and do then, any movies about that, the Kennedy. They, they're, they're pale yeah. comparisons. Yeah. Or yeah. what about this? Now, I, I know I know that Angelo's thought about this because I read it somewhere, and it's just the character there so big. Is I, I know he wrote an original screenplay called Risley, but he just couldn't finish yeah. it off because <laughs> the guy was yeah, no, 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 no. No, but, but <laughs> here's the thing about Knight, and, and uh, we're turning this into a Knight talk, and, and it's not where we wanted to go really, but people don't realize he's 6'5". I mean, he's a big man. I mean, he, 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 he's always surrounded exactly around right. six foot eight, six foot nine inch players, and he doesn't look on TV 
size diminishes you. I mean, I remember one time Maggie Johnson coming on to the Johnny Carson show, and I'm thinking, I'm the same size as Maggie Johnson. And I'm thinking, he dwarfed Johnny Carson. I'm thinking, God, is that what I look like in public? Is that my perception? Because I'm magic size. But people don't realize how big Knight of, of a man he was. Yeah, and absolutely. it's funny you say that. That's, that's about, part of his charisma. And, yeah, yeah, as far as Christmas, and I, and I got to meet one time, privileged as it was, I got to meet Billy Graham, and I thought, in, this, in a different genre entirely, but Knight yeah. carried almost that same charisma as Billy Graham. Um, you know, just that presence when he showed up. Like, when I met Billy Graham, it's like the room lit up. It's like there was a glow in the room. And when Knight walked in, and we tell the story all the time, is that in practice, whenever Knight patted you on that butt or, or said a compliment, it was like Christmas Day. It was like you, you took it so <laughs> yeah. to heart and, because it was so yeah. genuine. It was genuine. Yeah. You earned that compliment. You wasn't it wasn't was also. It was also rare. Rare and earned, but it was earned. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I want to wrap it up with one more thing, though, and, and that would be I know a lot of ideas die on shoot, studio sell, shelves. What yeah. idea do you think you had or what screenplay you wrote for a movie? Are you most disappointed that it didn't get made? Well, I had an, an extraordinary experience um, working with the Mantle family and, and telling Mickey Mantle's story. And it was from the point of view of <clears throat> alcohol, alcoholism and recovery. The whole movie took, takes place at the Betty Ford Center in those 28 days, <clears throat> and it tells his story through flashback and what he shares in a group therapy session. I consider it the best screenplay I've ever written. And it's, it's one that everybody who reads it thinks it should be made. But, uh, and I've gotten close so many times we never was able to push it over the top because generally people think it's so dark and, uh, and depressing, but, uh, you know, it ends, it ends in a positive way. So, you do go through two, two, two hours of hell, but it does, you know, end up in a, in a brighter place. But th- that's the movie. That, that's the movie that if I had one more shot to make one more movie, that would be it. All right, Steve, any final questions or comments for Angelo? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I, and I, I wrote this question down. It was the very first question I wrote down when I, I knew we were going to have the privilege to speak with you. I could go on for another three hours. I know you got to go away, but this is such an honor. Name well, your, if you can, if you can, what are your top three sports movies? We hear, because Hoosiers is always one or two. <clears throat> what are your top three sports movies of all time? I want to know that. Huh, well. Because you did Rudy. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we haven't even talked about Rudy. We didn't, we didn't get to Rudy. And well, what are your top Indiana three basketball, sports movies? This is an Indiana basketball podcast. Um, <laughs> no, um, actually, this is our national podcast, Survive in Advance. Oh, this yeah, is our we, national podcast. We, we went this out. way because... Colin works during the day, but we would love to have you on after an IU basketball game in the near future. Yeah, yeah. that'd be fun. Okay. I, would, I definitely, I would yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll do straight IU there and get Colin on, and you can rip on Colin, but yeah, I want to know what yes. your three top sports movies are. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I'm going to share with you is that once I started making them, and, and of course, uh, it was not just two years Rudy, we made another, uh, I made four all together, but I've written another 20. And I, I've toiled in the fields of this genre for such a long time that I have zero interest in watching a sports slash movie. I can never lose myself in them. I know every move that um, a draw, uh, you know, a screenwriter or director is going to make. And uh, I've, you know, I've written so many locker room speeches. I want to you know, like, never write another one again, <laughs> the rest of my life. So I haven't probably have I seen, a sports movie in the last 20 years? Probably not. I, 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 I'm sure there was something, but I can't offhand even tell you what it is. So based on that, I would say that, um, you know, a Raging Bull is probably my favorite. It's the most powerful. It was the most impactful. I think Scorsese is the, the, the greatest working director uh, today. Uh, and I, then I would put Bull Durham as 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 second ron shelton who wrote and directed is a friend of mine and you know that's his best movie i have great admiration for him in that film those are the two offhand i'm trying to think of a third 
you could probably what's your what are your three favorites? And let me see if I if I'm missing you two guys. Mine? What are your three favorites? Go ahead, yeah. Steve. Mike, go first. Oh, why do I have to go first? Okay, uh, um, listen, I, I please, watched, don't, please don't. I just watch Raging, don't, Raging no, don't Bull play, the other don't night. Don't play Rudy or Hoosier. I can never. Raging Bull was a little dark for me. I, I, I yeah. you know, yeah, but I, I you don't know, like my this heroes. is the thing. We've had this discussion when we had our top ten sports movies, and yeah, we did. Uh, yeah. We did Raging Bull 10, yeah. to me, the thing that's amazing is this: um, Jake LaMotta is a miserable human being, and he's the main character. And the movie still is a great movie. I mean, it's an unlikable yes. character, but yet it's still a great story. And the thing that's amazing to me is I do a lot of boxing shows. And from the mm-hmm. people I've talked to, Jake LaMotta was 10 times worse than what they portrayed him in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I think yeah. what, what he did, what, what, which is uh, one of the most difficult things to do in, in making movies, is to portray um, an actual human being who was a terrible human being and make us understand him. I think it wasn't, he never wanted uh, the audience to like him, but he just was earning, uh, uh, trying to break through people's perception in understanding him. And I think that that was accomplished by the end. All right, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. What are, your, what are your what are your what are the your two top uh, sports well, movies that are not? I mean, I'll, I'll go. Don't, I'll go. Don't, for me, yeah. I mean, obviously Hoosiers was is, is up there in the top three. But I, I, my most favorite of all time, probably really truly two of the two, three. I loved um, for the love of the game with um, with Billy Chapel and, and really? Kevin Costner. Yeah. Because you know what, you're about oh, the only person I've ever heard because mention the way, that movie. The, way the story was and told. I. I no, like the way the that flashbacks movie. And the way the... I agree, I'm Steve. Talking. I'm not ripping on you. I know. Now you know what it feels like. Uh, Go ahead. I, I, I love I love <laughs> the way the story was told, how he was flashing back, and how it all pieced together to come in that game and the thought process. I, I loved the way that movie was directed and produced and done. Um, and, you know, I was just – and Vince Scully doing the play-by-play and, and doing the game, and the whole setting was so good. I loved that one. I thought that was just a great movie. Um, I thought Bull Durham was just fun. And to me, sports in my life has always been fun. Um, I, I, Raging Bull disturbed me a little bit because it was so dark. Um, but it told a true story that needed to be told. But I want my sports stories to be enlightening, fun, and, and enjoyable. And Bull Durham probably was the greatest celebration of movies a baseball movies ever made. Just the, 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 yeah, the, the I, pure I love of these guys getting paid nothing, traveling in a crappy bus, going around, you know, and, and doing the antics that they did. Um, and, and along that same genre was Slapshot. I thought Slapshot was just hilarious. I mean, it, it was just I a never, funny I never saw movie. It. I never you saw never that. saw Slapshot. I, well, I, let, let me add, let me add one movie that people call for a sports movie, but I don't think it's a sports movie. I love Field of Dreams. I mean, it's just oh, uh, that's, that's my there's something one. special yeah. about that. But it's yeah, not a no. really a baseball movie, you know. It's but anyway. No, no, no. It, it, here's the story. Of Slat, uh, here's my story on Field of Dreams. We I got to play in uh, Fuzzy Zeller's Wolf Challenge one year as a celebrity, being an IU player. Actually, you know, Isaiah couldn't make it, so they, yeah. they asked me to pinch it for Isaiah. But yeah. I took the poster down, and and Kevin Costner was one of the big celebrities there that year that I got to play yeah. down in French Lick, or I mean, it, uh, his course down in, in um, not in French Lick, it's in Clarksville, I think, actually, but I, you know, I got to play, and I had Kevin Costner sign the poster of Field of Dreams on my son's back. And we were on the putting nice. green, and I, I walked up with the poster, and my son was out there on the putting green with me, and that's, I grew, I never saw my dad after I was eight years old. And yeah. so for, that's not a movie about baseball. It's a movie about a father finding a son. Yeah, absolutely. Is what yeah. it is. And that movie has more a lot of people put me. it in the category of sports movie. It's not a sports movie. It's not. It's a movie yeah. about a father and a son is what it is. Yeah. But you know what? And, and I, find... I don't think that just because I, I, I don't think Hoosiers was a sports movie. I, I think well, it was about. Can, this, I don't this is a discussion that we could, we could go on. Yeah. Take off on. I don't, <laughs> I never wrote them from the point of view. Uh, sports movies. The sports were just a frame. They were yeah. the backdrop. You know, it was and, all and about the characters you, yeah. and their and their journey and their and and their obstacles, their their blind yeah. spots and 
And, yeah. and I'll give you mine. Mine was Rocky, yeah. which I will always give him. And to me, Rocky, the first Rocky, let me be very clear yeah. on that. The first Rocky yeah. is a love story. I mean, it, it's it about it's yeah. about Rocky, and it's about Adrian. There's yeah. not much boxing in it. It's about a man that gets an opportunity and takes advantage of it. And let's face it, yeah. most people. Listen, Rocky's a great Rocky's a great movie. Yeah, There's and no most people, yeah. when they get the opportunity, are even afraid to take it. But he's a man who took it right. and turned it into like eight movies and then a Rambo series. Um, my other ones, <laughs> I, I love Hoosiers. <laughs> And I'm not saying it's because you're because you're on here. I, I remember going to see that movie when it first came out with my mom and dad. I was like 17 years old. I actually cried at the end of the movie. And, and the thing was, I remembered like in 1977 listening to Tim Johnson hit the shot to beat Risley. And that's not a rip on Risley. That's a great <laughs> moment. No, I'm serious. It's not. I, love it. I, I remember listening to the 1976 sectional championship game. I mean, I was like seven years old, and I would just curl up, you know, got a little blanket, it's cold outside, and I would listen to Aurora play Lawrenceburg. Um, you had the sectional, but then the great thing was the regional in the semi-state where you'd play, and people don't realize this that aren't from Indiana, the regional in the semi-state, you would play a 10 o'clock game, or a 10.30 game, and yeah. a 12 o'clock game. And at 2 o'clock, both teams would go back to the hotel, take a nap for three hours, and come back and play the championship game. And, and it was just yeah, yep. special. And my third movie, which I think may be the best sports movie of all time, was Body and Soul. Stars John Garfield. Yeah, it, it's that's a good abs- movie. That's yeah, a really it, good it's movie. a yeah. tremendous movie. That, well, you had a little film noir, which is what the sn- yeah. what snobs always talk about. But it was a great movie. And, I mean, Garfield yeah. formed his own company in 1946 to actually get the project made. It was the story of former lightweight champion and yeah. war hero Barney Ross. And he right. battles and defeats a drug problem. I know Steve's probably yeah. never seen it. But, Steve, go see Body and Soul with John Garfield. Yep. Okay. I agree. I will do that. I have not okay, seen Okay, can I, can I share one last story? Sure. Uh, before we oh, cut please. this off here. Uh, and, and and we're that on is, your time talking, now. We know you didn't go, but we're on we're, your time. Well, yeah, I, I actually have to go to the dentist here. <laughs> but uh, uh, So I'd much rather talk than go to the dentist. But uh, the, the, the story that probably inspired me more than any other high school story was in the 1966 sectional championship in Martinsville Gym home of uh, John Wooden. And Mm -hmm. it was at the time where there were so many high schools, this is before consolidation. um, There were 14 to 16 high schools in this one little sectional. And normally Bloomington high school, uh, this is before Bloomington North and South. uh, They would, they would, they won something like eight in a row just because they had a couple of thousand and uh, the only high school in Bloomington and the other small schools, you know, had 30, 40, 50 people. And, and uh, just about every one of those high schools is gone now. And uh, the, the game that I remember was a championship game that somehow this little school called Unionville. And there was a kid on this team who was like a phenomenal shooter. And one of the players on the team was a guy named Bill Chitwood. And he... Uh, he was a, a terrific player as well. Bobby Kent was a guy I played with in junior high school. He ended up playing at IU um, his freshman year. And uh, that game came down to a last-second shot. And, and I think it was Bill Chitwood who took that shot. It was – that was the, in that gym, which is a fantastic gym, that Martinsville gym, uh, I think it held like three or 4,000, which is why it was always held there. And every school, every person in that gym was cheering for Unionville against Bloomington High School, including me. And uh, that upset captured what I consider the essence of Indiana basketball. Because even though Unionville got beat, you know, in the, in the regional first game, it was like a mini state championship for them. And they are remembered till, still to this day. Uh, because of that and that's one of the great that's one of the losses of of going to class basketball is having this little kind of state championship these little upsets 
in the sectional regionals or semi-state. And uh, that's all gone now. I mean, nobody pays attention to sectionals. They they have to sometimes. Well, yeah, you have to drive two hours to, to get to the sectionals. miles sometimes. to another. Yeah. Place, you know, they don't. Everybody knew each other in this area. It was Monroe County and uh, and Martin County, I think, were the two areas. So that that story probably did more to get me a sense, make me understand what it was like to be in a gym during one of these yeah. great great upsets. Yeah, and the bad thing yeah, is. Well, Nobody gets to see that anymore because no, I don't. I the, the, pri- the privilege to have played sectionals at, at Hinkle and semi and regionals yeah. at Hinkle. And my wife went to Winslow High School in Winslow, Indiana. Yeah. Kit Farley was in Linville or Boonville, the next yeah. town over. And the towns would shut down. I mean, they would close. Yeah. Everything would be closed, and it said closed for sectionals. And we lost that. We, we absolutely lost that that romance. And yeah. you, know, you definitely lost it. And that was the great thing about Hoosiers was it, it gave people of this era a glimpse into what that romantic period of the development of the game of high school basketball and basketball period was. And that's what you captured so well in that movie was just the, the romance of, and I'm glad there wasn't a romance developed between Barbara Hershey and Gene Hackman. I mean, because, because the well, romance to, was the game of basketball in, in the, in the city and town of people that supported it. You know, when, when shit would come in was, and says, I'll play if coach stays. I mean, that's the, that's the most iconic line. I'll play if coach stays. Yeah, he and worked on that line that's, for about That's the chills I got. Yeah. <laughs> he was a basketball yeah. player. Uh, yeah, all no, right. Hey, guys, no, I, I got to take off. get it. Hey, Steve, we got to let Angelo go. Angelo, we would love to have you back. We can have you back weekly oh, if yeah. you want. But – We'll be All in right. touch with you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Angelo. All right. Thank you, guys. Talk to you uh, later. All right. Uh, Steve, tomorrow we'll have Brian Ralph, who is a basketball writer at Fan Sided and the Busting Brackets, to talk a little college basketball. Um, can we just want... see if Angelo will come back? Uh, that's can fine. We can have back? Angelo on every day for an hour. Well, Mike, Steve, and Angelo. <laughs> I can talk well, to what, what a treasure. What, it'll what be Mike, treasure. Angelo, and Steve. But, all right, <laughs> or Angelo, Mike, and Steve. I'm good with that, too. Um, at least when you listed your favorite sports movies, you didn't say Talladega Nights, which I know is truthfully in your top three, if I not, actually just you're number one. That. I watched that Christmas Eve night. I watched Talladega Nights Christmas Eve night, yeah. yeah. Shake and bait. Yeah. Well, I was hoping that you wouldn't go so low-brow as to start screaming, shake and bake at Angelo Pizzo. <laughs> Pizzo. <laughs> What a treat! What what a pleasure to have that man on, and we we only tapped in, we barely tapped into his knowledge of sports, and the essence of what we try and do on this show is, you know, cut it a different way. And gosh, what a privilege! All right, and if anybody has any stories about the 1966 Unionville Sectional Championship team. I, I had forgotten about that team, but I've written some articles before about like Montez- Montezuma High School in 1954 and stuff. I'm going to try to find out a little bit more and see if we can do an article on 1966 Unionville High School. So if anybody has any info there, you can tweet me at Grueling Truth. Would love to talk about it, especially if you know somebody that played on that team and can put me in touch. Um, Steve, we're going to wrap the show up for today. We'll talk a little college basketball tomorrow. Are we doing an Indiana Basketball Weekly show tonight or tomorrow night? Yes, we are. And I'm working on a guest right now. As soon as we get done with this call, I'm going to make a phone call to a friend of mine that will be a great much. I'm not going to announce because I don't know if I can get him or not, just short notice. All righty. Um, I'll tell you, you know, in a minute. But, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, I definitely see a show. It's midweek. Let's take yes. a look at the Hoosiers It'll be our secret. Steve as we head into Big Ten season. It'll be me and Steve's secret. So, I'm going to get off here so I can find out what Steve's secret is. I want to remind you all, you can follow us at Grueling Truth. You can follow Steve Risley at at srisley34. Um, You can hear all of our shows on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you find sports podcasts, you'll find the Grueling Truth. So for Anthony Pizzo, or (laughs) Angelo Pizzo, Bobby Risley, what? I still think there should be a movie you, you, named you Grizzly. You guys any of our guests name right? <laughs> <laughs>
You're calling Pete Quinn, Jim. Wait all a second. Day long. Wait a second. I called him John once, and it was just once. Jim. And you in Jim my defense, times. in my defense, I've been hit in the head a lot, and I've had a rough life because of that. <laughs> and I don't remember a lot of things. Um, so there. That's fine. And see. If I was a normal person with a normal radio show, I would just edit that out. But I'm not. I'm going to leave it there. Because the grueling truth is, sometimes I forget That's what makes us the grueling truth. So, for Angelo Pizzo, Steve Risley. Thank you. I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth. Are you sure you're Mike Goodpaster? Are you sure you're Mike Goodpaster? Think. No. We're the legends. What? (laughs) Where the legend? You're now making good passes to me from now on.